One, two, three. Testing one, two, three. All right. Very good. Welcome to our um, evangelistic uh, training seminar this evening at the Cato Mills Church of Christ, or Cato Mills Church of Christ. We're grateful for your attendance. We know that some of you have come from uh, distant places, and uh, we are thankful for your interest in personal evangelism. I, I don't know of a more important work um, that the church can focus than evangelism, and I hope that will become very apparent in this seminar. I apologize for the uh, late start tonight with some technology issues, but those have been rectified. Now, everyone, if you came into the audience tonight and did not receive the material, raise your hand. Uh, you should have received the booklets, uh, the uh, training uh, seminar manual. You'll need that material. Raise your hand if you did not get it. We will hand, all right, we have some up here that need that material, several uh, that actually need the material. We'll be referring to that material throughout this seminar, and we want to make sure that everyone is able to keep pace with the the um, material tonight. And so we'll just take care of a few housekeeping items. Uh, my name is Rob Whitaker. I come from Jacksonville, Alabama. I travel the country with my family. And uh, our job, our mission is to train the saved to teach the lost. This is our 28th Church of Christ this year to train. And uh, we have um, we keep a very busy schedule. Uh, we literally crisscross the country. We are in Texas for the next couple of weeks. Uh, we will be training uh, two congregations and the Brown Trail School of Preaching. And so this is, uh, we've, we, we are excited to be with you tonight and uh, looking forward to our time together. This is going to be, I hope, a game changer. Um, most elderships, uh, preachers, uh, members of the church will tell us that this is, a, this is a paradigm shift. I did not come for a pep rally, brethren. This is not a July 4th fireworks session. I didn't come to... To, to, to present a fiery lesson and, and, and rile up the crowd. I, that's not why I'm here tonight. I, I'm here to get change in the church, and I'm honest with that. I did not come to keep the status quo. If you want to keep the status quo, you do not want this preacher here tonight. The status quo is not working. We've come not to change the doctrine of the church. We have come to change the culture of the church. We are living in different times, and we must adapt or the Church of Christ is not going to sustain, be sustainable in this country. And so I, what I'm proposing and what we're teaching churches all over this country is a, based upon a, a working model. It's not a theory. I didn't come to preach a theory. Um, if, if I came uh, to, to an audience and a preacher got up and said, I've got this idea, well, I would ask a question. Show me it works, and then I'll, I'll think about it. This isn't an idea. This isn't a theory. This is a scripturally-based model that uh, we're teaching churches something we used to be very good at, something that we can be good at again, and something that has a proven track record. Everywhere we go, a church, if they adopt this, if, they, if they'll put their heart and soul into this, it will, it will transform. It will be a paradigm shift. You'll, you'll see visible changes. It will not be preacher-led. It will not be preacher-run. It will not be preacher-only. It will be congregational in nature. It will be congregational in focus. It will be congregational in work. It will involve every single member of this church. It will involve every member of whatever church it is that makes this mission their most important and only mission. I am not here to compete with your other missions. Brethren, I'm here, and I hope this will be something that you can run with to make evangelism your mission, the mission. It's got to be the complete focus of the church. What I want to do is begin by asking you to open up your Evangelism Simplified Guidebook to the very last page. So open up your guidebook to the last page, get out your pen, because you're going to do a lot of writing tonight. You're at school, and the first assignment you have is to write down this website, right on the back page where it says notes, write down evangelism.housetohouse.com. This is going to be a tool for your for your future reference. This is going to help you, uh, provide for you uh, instruction, uh, provide for you uh, uh, um, uh, the uh, techniques and tools needed to be successful. Now, don't put a www in front of it because it's a hidden website. In other words, we're not necessarily advertising this to every soul in the world. We're, we're advertising this to Christians. We want this to be your website. This is something to train members of the church. Now, if a sinner gets on there, it's all right, but that's really not what they need. Um, this is not designed to convert them. This is designed to train you to convert them. So evangelism.housetohouse.com. Three years ago, we made the most difficult decision in our life. We decided to step out of full-time work, 22 years, 11 years at the Willett Church, and uh, I decided that we were going to begin a school of evangelism. And um, 
uh, I was hurting. My heart was heavy. Um, I was tired of seeing churches close their door. I was tired of seeing congregations shrink year after year. And I'd seen at Willette and at Hillsboro and at Poole, I'd seen what worked. And I wanted to share it. And I was getting phone calls, more phone calls than I could handle. Churches were asked, can you come teach us? And we would come. But it was, it was difficult to maintain a full-time pulpit work and, and to go to all these churches. We had a decision to make. And the decision was to start a school. Now, now thankfully to God, we had an opportunity to place our school under the house to house, heart to heart. Alan Webster called and said, hey, Rob, he said, uh, he said, if you uh, put your school under our umbrella, we'll provide you what you're not good at. I said, what am I not good at? He says, you're a terrible designer. He says, you're a terrible website master. You're terrible at promotion and advertisement. He says, your materials look awful. He said, but if you let us um, provide you secretaries, design artists, graphic artists, uh, editors, because you make so many mistakes. He said, if you'll do that, he said, we'll, we'll uh, turn a sow's ear into a silk purse. And that's what they've done. They, 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 they have a, been an amazing asset to our family. And so we went, we went full speed ahead. We established this school, brethren. It has taken off like a rocket ship. We cannot, we cannot, we can hardly hang on. And the results are what I'm most interested in. I'm going to share with you this week, in the next couple of days, the results. What happens when a church embraces the evangelistic strategy that we're teaching? And I believe that you'll be highly motivated when you see it. Let's go ahead and get started. The Bible says, um, the Bible, well, let's see, can you advance that for me? I, I think, uh, I don't know if it went to sleep on me or, let's see, would you advance the slide for me one time? Let's see, there we go. There we go. Proverbs 11 and verse 30, the fruit of the righteous is the tree of life. And he that winneth souls is wise. There is not a wiser course of action for any Christian, any church to take than soul winning. I want to make that very clear. There isn't anything this church can focus on that is more important than this. I don't care what it is. I, I don't care if it's your graduation banquet, your vacation Bible school, or your gospel meeting. Brethren, evangelism is the heartbeat of the church. If you're not, if evangelism is not beating in your church, your church is dead. So I want to commend, I want to commend this church, the preacher, your men, for understanding the value and the importance of this. Go ahead and advance it for me again. It, it went to sleep on me. I don't know why it's doing that, but we'll try to try to rectify. I might have to have you advance several times. So go ahead and put that forward. Let's see. There we go. Number one, let's get motivated. My first goal and my most important mission in this session is to prove to you evangelism works. Brethren, if this is not accomplished, this seminar is dead in the water. Most Christians do not believe evangelism works. Most Christians believe that evangelism works in India, but it doesn't work in America. And so we'll be glad to go to Jamaica, but it doesn't work in Texas. Uh, preacher, you don't understand. Well, I am, my goal in this, this first session is to prove that evangelism works in your country. Number two, I, I, want to, um, I want to also emphasize that the way that church grow is by sticking with the Bible. We don't need a modern, we don't need a modern gimmick. We don't need new gadgets. We, we don't need to change the doctrine. We need to use the Bible. Brother, it's the one thing that others don't have. The one thing that we've got that nobody else seems to have, why in the world would you shy away from it? Number three, let's talk about how to get into a Bible study. Let's, let's educate our church members how to get people to study their Bible. Then we're going to look at number four. Let's, let's make sure that when we, when we get somebody to commit to study the Bible, we've got a method. Do we, we've got to have something to teach them. We, we've got to have something that we can use to bring them to the cross. Then we're going to apply this to your world. We're going to make this real. Evangelism is nothing if it's, if it's, a, it's a theory. Brother, I am not a walking theory. This is real stuff. I want to make this real to you. I want to, I'm going to give you real life scenarios. I'm going to show you how to overcome obstacles. I'm going to show you how, how to overcome uh, challenges, that there's nothing you can face that God cannot overcome. Then we're going to divide up women and men. My wife, who's not with us tonight, she's uh, resting tonight, um, needed a little bit extra rest. So she's uh, going to be with you tomorrow, Lord willing. Pray for her. Her name's Nicole. And uh, we travel as a family. It can be weary at times. And um, she's going to take the ladies, and she's going to train the ladies how to use their talents and gifts to reach the lost. Um, how, how, you have abilities. You have, uh, you have um, uh, um, natural traits that men do not have. Ladies, we need you. We're half as effective without you. 
You, you've got to be on board. Then I'm going to take the men, and I call it the fix-it session. Brethren, we're broken. Men like to fix things, but I'm going to give you the directions. <laughs> I'm going to give you the 10-point plan. So we're going to look at that together. My favorite session is not advertised. It's the private session I usually have with the leadership. I sit with elders, preachers, the men, the preacher. We sit down and we put it in drive. Before I leave this church, you will be in drive. I've, 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 I've been to uh, over 100 congregations. I've yet to have a church stay in neutral. They all get in drive before we leave. So th we're not coming, again, just to have a pep rally. This is going to be visible changes. We're going we're to focus every ounce of energy we have in saving souls. Let's get started. In the year 2000, we had 13,155 churches of Christ in this country. In the year 2009, we had 12,629 churches of Christ. In 2015, we had 12,300 churches of Christ. In 2018, 11,965 churches of Christ. I don't know if you can see the pattern. Brethren, we're losing churches of Christ. Churches of Christ are literally shutting their door. Brethren, we don't have churches that are being built anymore. We have churches that are being closed. Somebody came up to me several years ago, and they said, Preacher, those numbers are not very reflective of the church in America because they don't take into consideration consolidation. Well, I don't know what business line you're in, but consolidation usually doesn't go with growth. But I said, tell me more about it. He said, well, now, we don't need a church on every street corner, so we're consolidating. We, we don't live in the horse and buggy era anymore. You know? So we are just trying to close down the small churches, and uh, and doesn't mean we're declining. I said, explain these numbers. The year 2000, 1,265,000 churches. 2009, 1,224,000 churches. 2015, 1,180,000 uh, members 2018 1,128,000 members i don't know if you see the pattern we're not only losing churches we're losing members the church of christ is on the decline and brethren those were pre-covid we have done nothing but watch members of the lord's church dwindle down year after year decade after decade and friends now we're at a period of time in the lord's church where we barely number a million christians anymore brethren we're losing I don't know if that sits well with you, but it doesn't sit well with me. And I want to give you an historical perspective. I want, to, I, want to, I want to zoom out just for a minute. So let's go back to 1906, and let's look at where we've come from. In 1906, in this country, we had a population of 85 million people. We had a membership of the Lord's Church, about 159,000. Now, to put that into a, a, a manageable form, that means for every Christian, um, there are 535 people. You're going to walk across 535 people before you come across a Christian. That's not good. Now, in 1946, there were 141 million people in this country. Now, watch the ratio. There are 682,000 Christians. Now, there's one Christian for every 207 people you meet. That's in 40 years. Now, look at this. 1953, seven years later, we go to 160 million people in this country. Now, we're at a ratio of 1 to 106, 1 1.5 million Christians. 1967, 198 million people in this country. Members of the Lord's Church, 2.3 million. Now, the ratio is down to 1 to 84, and that continued into the 1970s. Friends, can you imagine being in a country where one out of every 84 people that you meet is a member of the Church of Christ? No wonder God blessed America. America. Brethren, this nation became the greatest nation on earth because Christians were on the rise. Righteousness prevailed. Righteousness exalts a nation and sin is a reproach to any people. You want to fix the United States of America? Let's get the church growing again. This is what made this country great. Dear friends, the Church of Christ grew during World War I. The Church of Christ grew during the Great Depression. The Church of Christ grew during World War II. The Church of Christ grew during uh, uh, Korea, Vietnam, civil rights, the feminist movement, every major upheaval this nation has faced. The Lord's Church prevailed until recently. Something happened to us. And all we have done is decline. We have done nothing but shed church members year after year, decade after decade. Now where the ratio is at the very best, 1 to 289. That was pre-COVID. Brethren, if this doesn't stir your heart, if this doesn't sit in your gut and cause you to squirm tonight, I don't know what will. We are facing, we are facing a 
a, 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 um, a battle. We have a, a, a challenge before us in this generation, unlike any generation has ever had in this country. We're losing the very church of Christ before your very eyes. Don't you worry, we'll have the graduation banquet. We'll make sure we have Bible camp. We'll make sure we have the VBS. And we do the same things year after year, and all we continue to see is the numbers of the Lord's church decline. And I've come tonight to challenge you. I've come tonight, brethren, to suggest that if we don't make a dramatic change in our focus, that those numbers will not change. When I look at the eyes of members of the church today, and I sit with elders, and I, I don't know a preacher in the brotherhood in the last three years that has sat at the table of more elderships, and I don't say this in any other way, just as a matter of fact, than we have. I sit at the table of elders time after time, all year long, and I have heartfelt talks with them. They don't believe it works. I mean, they, they it, it, by and large, church members believe this is a failure Preacher, I know you're going to preach Matthew 28, the Great Commission. I get it. I, I know we've got to talk to our neighbors. We've got to be good. At, I, I get it. Preacher, it doesn't work. And so what we do is we send them to India. We send them to Africa. We send them to Latin American missions. We send them to Jamaica. And we send our money by the boatloads where our country is disintegrating before our very eyes. I'm going to challenge you tonight. Brethren, I'm asking you to to focus your evangelistic efforts in kettle mills. I'm asking you to focus commerce. I'm asking you to focus where you live. Because if we don't do that, there won't be a church of Christ left. Why don't you believe? Because you haven't seen it. To be honest, you've heard it, but you haven't seen it. We haven't seen a successful evangelistic model strategy in a long time. I mean, there are pockets of it, but it's rare. By and large, we see failure. You know, we, we fire up a church. Let's go door knocking. And, we, and we're, we'll say, and we'll finally fire them up. We'll get 40, 50 people out there. We'll spend a day, two days knocking doors. And you know what you're looking for on Sunday, right? Just, what, just one person come. And nobody comes. We wasted all of our effort. And we go right back into our church buildings. It doesn't work, preacher. You know, you fire them up with an evangelistic lesson. You know, we got to save souls. And you wait for week after week. No Bible studies, no baptisms. But you got the baptistry ready. Where are the baptisms? Brethren, don't believe it works. They haven't seen it. I want to talk to you about something that changed my family. I've always loved evangelism. But I didn't get it until this day. Hello? Uh, yes, sir, are you the preacher at the Willette Church of Christ? I said, yes, my name is Rob Whitaker. He says, yeah. He said, I'm glad I found you. And I said, yes, sir. He says, well, he said, I, 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 I need some help. And I said, what do you got? He says, well, I, I, I'm a preacher. And he says, um, he says, I live near Freed Hardman. And he says, I've got a couple I need you to go visit. And he says, I need you to do a Bible study with them. And I said, great. I said, this is wonderful. I said, well, tell me about it. He said, well, we just had this, this uh, new family uh, place membership. Her name's Scarlett. Uh, his name is William. I said, okay. And Scarlett's just become a Christian. I said, well, man, that, that's great. I said, uh, tell me a little bit more about him. He says, well, he says, uh, she came to me a few weeks ago. She says, I, I need someone to go meet my mother and my father and do a Bible study with them. And um, I'm calling you to do it. I said, this is amazing. I said, I love Bible studies. I said, what are their names? She said, Jackie and Sheila Burke. I said, I'll be right there. I said, I said brother, I said, uh, um, could you tell me uh, when did they schedule the Bible study? He says, well, he says, uh, he says, we haven't established a day just yet. I said, well, no problem. I'm on good morning, noon or night, two in the morning. I, you know, just tell me when they want to do it. I said, no, brother, when did they contact her? What, 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 how long has this interchange been going on? He says, well, he said, they really haven't asked yet. I said, they haven't asked yet. He said, no. I said, I said well, well uh, are they interested? Well, we don't know. I said, brother, how, how, how do you suppose I go set a Bible study up with somebody who's not asked for a Bible study? He says, I don't know, but that's your problem now. And I said, well, thanks for nothing, Chris. Chris uh, hung up the phone, and uh, I looked at that piece of paper. It had Jackie and Sheila Birdwell on it. I said, that's the most foolish thing I've ever seen in my life. And I can't go up and just force a Bible study on somebody. And so um, I threw that piece of paper in the trash can. I went back to the important things like folding church bulletins. Got to have a church bulletin. 
And so I folded my church bulletins and I put them out on the on the table and I had everything ready for Sunday morning. I'd done my job, you know. I went back home and uh, before I left the parking lot, man, I, I can tell you that I, I wasn't feeling good. I said, preacher, what are you doing? You can't throw two souls away. So I marched back into my office. I grabbed that piece of paper out of the trash can. I put it on my table and I looked at it. I don't know what I'm going to do with you. And I went home. I preached that Sunday and I didn't sleep well that night. I went back to my office on that Monday. And you know what was sitting on my, on my desk? <laughs> Jackie and Sheila Birdwell. And um, I said, man, I, I don't, what am I supposed to? I said, I'll tell you what, anytime I come to a place in my life where I don't know what to do, I pray. So I bowed my head and I, pray, I prayed for Jackie and Sheila. I prayed for me. I prayed for wisdom. I prayed for a door of utterance. I prayed for, I prayed for, uh, uh, I, I prayed for understanding as I studied the word. I, 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 I poured my heart out. I said, amen. I looked at that piece of paper, still there. I said, well, what kind of, what kind of prayer doesn't accompany faith? What kind of faith doesn't accompany works? I said, I've got to do something. So I began, I began a, uh, I don't know if you've ever had any of these uh, studies before. I began a challenging study. I was going to challenge. You know, since I've been a boy, I'd always studied Jesus. My, my mother, Bible class teacher, my Bible class teacher, she taught me Jesus as the creator of the world. Day one, day one, God made light when there was none. She put the days of creation in my bedroom so I would memorize them. I knew Jesus as my creator. When I was a little older, I studied Jesus as my savior. She had the cross in my room, and we talked about, you know, Jesus who died for my sins, and, and I, I studied Jesus as my, then later on in life, I studied Jesus as the head of the church. He put the church in my, I studied Jesus as the head of the church. But you know what I'd never done? I'd never studied Jesus as the great evangelist. I'd never done it. I mean, I'd gone through schools of preaching. I'd gone through, I'd got, I, I had gone through graduate work in our schools, and I'd never even, never even uh, attempted to look at Jesus as an evangelist. That's going to change. I opened my Bible, and I started the study. My goal is to find Bible studies of Jesus. Let's find what Jesus did, and here's why. I want to be honest with you tonight. What, here's what I found. I found the things that Jesus did that made him so successful. I didn't do them, and the things that I did, I thought, I thought made me a great evangelist. Jesus did not do them. And I, I told myself, if I ever get a shot at Jackie and Sheila, I will, I'm going to I'm going to start new. I'm going to I'm going to do the things I've learned, although it's completely different than anything I'd ever done before. I'm going to do it. Sure enough, Jonathan Smith comes home from college, sits in my room, and we're at my office, and we're talking. And he was in Knoxville in Carnes, and uh, he'd met this little girl, Elizabeth uh, uh, Darnell. And they're going to get married, you know. And he's telling me all about it. And and, uh, and uh, he's he's a uh, hey Rob. He said, man, it's so good to be home. I got so many people to see. And he said, I'm going to go see my best friend. I said, well, who is it? Evan Birdwell. Evan Birdwell. Hey, Jonathan. Is uh, Evan Birdwell related to Jackie and Sheila Birdwell? Oh yeah, Rob, that's like that's that's like my second parents. Yeah, that, I said, well, take me with you. He said, well, why would you want to go meet Jack? I said, I said, Jonathan, I'll explain on the way. I got in his car. He drove me. We went over to their house. I said, Jonathan, you have one rule: don't tell him who I am. Do not tell him I'm your preacher. Just get me in the door. I'll do the rest. So he knocks on the door. You know, we walk up there, and uh, he uh, he said he 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 looks at. Uh, uh, she opens the door. She said, John, oh, and she hugs him, you know, and says, oh, it's so good to see you, you know. And I said, well, I was, she said, hey, who you got with you? Oh, that's just my friend, Rob. Well, man, any friend of Jonathan's, a friend of mine, come on in. Like any good Southern woman, she had chocolate chip cookies and sweet tea waiting. We, we sat around the table, you know, we had a little bit of discussion, 15, then came the awkward moment. Like, uh, now, who'd you say that? Who, who, who are you again? I said, uh, well, that's a good question. I said, Sheila, Jackie, I said, let me properly introduce myself. My name is Rob Whitaker. I am the preacher for the Willette Church of Christ, and you've got questions for me. She says, I sure do. And she just let them rip. I mean, just one right after the other. I mean, they rolled off her tongue. And uh, I'm going to do something that I've never done before. She asked, and I, I'm not answering. I'm not answering any questions. I'm going to practice something called deferment. I'm going to defer every question she asks. I'm not answering. And you say, preacher, why didn't you ask? I answer the questions. I'll show you. I'll show you in the next lesson. So I deferred it right back around. She, I deferred it right back around. Now, she doesn't really catch on to what I'm doing because I'm making a very conversational. I'm, 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 not, I'm not being abrupt. I'm not being rude. 
But I'm not going to answer that question. So she I wrapped it around. I wrapped it around. And finally, she, she figured it out. She said, Jackie, why won't that man answer my questions? And I said, uh, Sheila, that's a good observation you just made. I tell you what, uh, I said, would you let me show you the answer? Show me? I said, yeah, like uh, we'd open our Bible. You mean a Bible study? I said, well, you call it whatever you want to. She oh, Jackie, can we do a Bible study with a preacher for the church of Christ? Jackie said, now, honey, I don't think it's ever wrong to study the Bible. She said, now, I don't know about this. I, 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 she, I tell you what, she said, here's what we'll do. She says, we'll do this study of yours, preacher, but it's got to be a secret study no one can know. And I said, well, I've never done a secret study. I said, I said uh, can I count a proposal? She says, what do you got? I said, well, can I tell my elders? She said, well, why would you want to tell elders? I said, well, somebody's got to pray about it. And, uh, well, who are these men? I said, well, Joe Lynn, uh, Hugh Wayne Clark, Hugh Clark. Well, I know those men. I, I grew up with them. You, you can tell those men. And just tell them not to tell anybody. If they find out, they're excommunicate me. I said, excommunicate? I said, all, all, all right. I'm not even, I said, okay. And I said, you got a deal. So I came back to, the, to their house Monday or Tuesday, and we're, a, we're just a visiting and a talk, you know, I walk, walk in the house. And, and I said, you guys got a table? Yeah, right. I said, let's sit around the table. So we sat around the table, and I said, I just opened to have these booklets. And I said, I passed out book number one, green booklet, and John 8, 32. I said, she, she said, now you just wait one minute, preacher. Now what? She says, I need to tell you about my religious experience. She said, now, Rob, it was a dark and stormy night. And she says, the rain was falling hard. I could barely see, and the lightning was striking, and the thunder was roaring. And she said, and it was really bad. And she said, Rob, I, was, I could barely see the road. And all of a sudden, the lightning struck the tree, and it caught on fire, and it fell across the road. She said, Rob, I knew I was going to die right there, and the Holy Spirit came down. You don't believe me, do you? You're laughing at me. You do not believe me, do you? I said, now, Sheila, if that's what you said happened, and I'm writing it down. And she says, it did happen, Rob. The Holy Spirit came down, took over the car, swerved me off into the ditch, saved my life, and Jesus came into my heart. He became my personal Savior. I went to the church the next Sunday. I testified all about it. Then I, and they told me I'd had the religious experience. They voted on it. And it was unanimous. And she said, and a month later, we decided to have the baptisms. And I said, well, Sheila, I said, that's a... You're a very religious person. She said, oh, I love my Lord. I said, I can tell. I said, Sheila, would it be okay if we read John 8, 32? Oh, of course. I said, let's do it together. You should know the truth, and the truth will make you free. I said, Sheila, what makes you free? She said, truth. I said, put it in the blank, and she did, and we started our Bible study. We went to John 17, 17, and they read it. They put, we went to John 4, 24. We read, we, we just kept doing our Bible study together. The more we studied the Bible, the more, the more uh, confident they got, and, and they were loving it. And you could tell the light was beginning to shine, and they were learning things that they'd never seen before. Jackie said, Rob, we need to talk. I said, he said, I've enjoyed the study. I said, good. He said, Rob, I learned things I didn't know. He said, but you need to know something about Sheila and I. I said, well, what you guys got? He said, we're missionary Baptists. I said, it's all right. He said, well, Rob, I'm just not a missionary Baptist. I'm the deacon, the treasurer, and I'm the Bible class teacher. I said, well, man, it's obvious to me that you are a very devout religious person, and I love devout religious people. Paul loved them too. I said, I, I, I said, I'm so glad I'm in this home. He said, yeah. And she said, now, Rob, she says, she said, I am the Bible class teacher for the little children. I started it. When my children were little, we didn't even have Bible classes. And I said, no. I tell you what, uh, Jackie, if you're the treasurer, you must be a good steward. He said, well, I, I said, they must trust you. He said, well, I, I do the best I can. He said, Rob, he said, I, I'll be honest. I learned some things tonight I didn't know. I said, would you like to do another study? He said, sure, I would. I said, well, let's come back next week, study number two. He says, all right. So I went back home. I told my, my family all about it. I said, man, this is exactly what we want. I said, this is, I, I went to the church. I'm going to do something I'd never done before. I got in the pulpit and said, church. I said, I'm going to talk about evangelism practical evangelism no theories i can't give you their names but i want to tell you what's going on i need you to pray about this family and uh, i went back to their house and uh we sat around the table we passed out the blue booklet book number two we passed it out and they're looking at it you know and i said well let's talk about the church matthew 16 18 jesus said upon this rock and, I, and we started going through the study. Man, they loved it. I, they, I, I know in that study, things that directly contradict their, their, their religion, they're in there. I said, Jackie, I said, you got a problem with that, that, that verse? No. 
Jackie, are, are you sure that you sure you're okay with that answer? He says, yeah. He said, Rob, if it's in the Bible, I'll put it down. You got to respect a person like that. Brother, he put down the right answer every single time. And I know the things he's writing down, that's not what they practice. And in fact, when the study was over, Jackie said, man, I learned a lot. I said, well, great. I said, he said, I, I, I'm, I'm glad. I, I went home. I said, Nicole, you'll never guess. I said, he said, if it's in the Bible, he'll write it down. I said, you can't ask for much more than that. And, uh, and uh, so I said, but you know, study three is going to be tough. I said, Nicole, they're lost. They don't know it. I said, I got to find out how to reach them. And I said, I said, I tell you what, I'm going to call Scarlett. So I got, I got to Chris Coyle. I said, Chris, I need Scarlett's number. He gave me Scarlett's number. I, I called Scarlett and I said, Scarlett, I got, I got questions for you. She said, are you Rob Whitaker? I said, yes, ma'am. You're the one teaching my mama? I said, yes, ma'am. I couldn't get a word in for 45 minutes. I mean, that, that girl was so excited. And I said, Scarlett, I just need to ask you some questions. She said, well, go ahead, preacher. I said, I need to know why you became a Christian. She told me two things in her answer that I will never forget. Number one, I'll tell you right now. She said, Rob, she says, uh, I came to my parents. I said, I've been studying the Bible. Mom and dad, I want to be a Christian. You already are a Christian. I explained it to them. Now, Scarlett, you know if you do this, we'd be forced to excommunicate you. I said, what does this excommunicate mean? She says, well, Rob, that means the deacons are coming. I said, the deacons? She says, Robin, they're bringing the briefcase. I said, well, the briefcase? She said, oh, yeah. She said, the, and she says, and, and, and they warned me. And she said, they want, and she said, I told my parents, I can't wait for them to bring the briefcase. She said, because I'm going to have my Bible open and I'm going to show them why I did what I did. And I wanted to convert my parents and I couldn't think of a better way to do it. And they brought the briefcase and they sat down in her house. They opened the briefcase and they brought out the tablet. It's the church roster. And they began to read the church roster. She said, when they got to my name, it said Scarlett Birdwell. They said Scarlett Birdwell. And they took the big eraser and they erased me. And um, I said, what else did they do? Oh, they put it back in the briefcase. And I said, Scarlett, what happened next? They left. I said, that's all that happened that night. She said, Rob, they didn't ask me one Bible question. They didn't ask me why I left. They didn't even bring a Bible. We didn't even have prayer together, Rob. She says, my parents were livid. Jackie, you mean we've been going to this church all our lives, and they didn't even try to win our daughter back. What's wrong with those men? I just thought you'd like to know that, Rob. I said, that's good, Scarlett. So I get, it's, it's the last study. Jonathan and I show up at the house. I'm about to knock on the door. And uh, Jackie says, Sheila, you and I got to talk. Before this little preacher gets in this house, you need to know something. He thinks he's going to baptize us tonight. He says, he's got another thing coming. He said, I've been a Baptist all these years, and I'm going to die a Baptist. And Scarlett and, and Sheila said, now, Jackie, shoo. She says, you know what? Uh, Grandmama's a Baptist. Mama's a Baptist. I was raised in this church, and I'm going to die a Baptist. And he says, I'm glad you got that covered. And then I rang the doorbell. Don't underestimate the power of the Word of God. We sat around that table. I had no idea that conversation just took place minutes before I arrived. And we just read our Bibles. The more we read our Bibles, I could see the more that Jackie and Sheila, they were getting it. And in fact, I could see that Jackie was getting it. When I got the baptism, I'll be honest with you, I, 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 I brought out my charts. They're in your guidebook. And I laid, I laid one of them out. And I, I, we were in back to the Bible. I said, we're going to illustrate this, Jackie. And we built our case one by one. And I could see it. it. There's no way out. It's inescapable. It's unavoidable. There's only one conclusion you can draw. And we had a problem that problem is he got it he knew tears began to swell up in his eyes his hands were shaking he couldn't miss it he's lost I said Jackie I said uh, I said what are you going to do with this information you've learned tonight he looked up at me and he says Rob I know exactly what I have to do and we're going to do it I said God bless you I said, let's go right now. And, um, and uh, Sheila knew what her husband was saying because she looked over at him and said, Jackie, you said we weren't going to do that. And she hit him in his gut. He grabbed his stomach. He leaned over. He looked at his wife. He said, Sheila, we have no choice. That's what the Bible says. I said, let's go right now.
Jackie said, no, Rob, I can't do it tonight. And I said, that devil doesn't give up. And I said, I'm not going to let him. And I said, Jackie, I said, today's the day, you know, of salvation. I said, Jackie, don't be like almost thou persuadest me. I said, yeah, I said, Jackie, I said, take up your cross. Jackie, I said, same hour of the night, life is a vapor. I mean, I went to all the verses. Didn't budge. I don't know what to do. So I finally just was honest. I said, Jackie, I don't get it. What are you waiting for? He said, Rob, you don't understand, and I don't expect you to. I hold the bag. I said, the bag? He said, Rob, I'm the treasurer. I have to resign. I have the money in the house. He says, I've got I've to give it back. I, I don't know about you, but I struggled with that answer. When I left the house that night, I, I really struggled. I was reading Matthew 7 years later, and now I'm at peace with it. Jesus said, bring ye therefore fruits worthy of repentance. You know, it doesn't take long for a 15-year-old young man to change his life, but it takes a little longer for a 55-year-old man to change his life. And what Jackie was telling me that night, what I didn't get is I've got to repent and make changes. It will take me a little time, but I will do it. Rob, you can come back to my house every day until I do. And oh, we did. Every day I went back to his house. My children, Nicole, we walked up to the porch. We'd swing on the porch. The kids would pick strawberries in the garden or whatever it is. And I had more tomatoes than I knew what to do with. And I, I mean, every day I went back. And I would, Jackie, is today the day? Not today, Rob, but it's coming. I was standing in the back of the auditorium. It's a fan-shaped auditorium. Wednesday night, usually about 2.30 of us. People were coming in. I was talking to Miss Jill, Sister Jill, one of the deacon's wives. That is Jackie and Sheila Birdwell coming into our church building. I said, it is. No, Rob. Rob, Rob that, no, no, no. Rob, is, is that the couple you've been studying with? I said, it is. She says, Rob, I, I can't believe it. And we don't believe, do we? We don't believe this works. Not in our country. You got to go to India. You, you can't teach people in your community like it's not people you grew up with. They don't want it. They're beyond hope. I want you to know what happened that night when they walked forward. 230 Christians wept. There was not a dry eye in that church because they saw something that they did not believe possible and they were baptized. That's Jackie Birdwell, six months later, doing an invitation for the Lord's Church. This is her son, Evan, because we're just getting started. I said, Nicole, we've got something. I said, the principles I'm learning, I said, I said we got to keep this going. And so I immediately just went to work. And brethren, I focused on it. I, mean, I focused like a laser beam. And I want you to know this evening that if you'll focus your church on evangelism, you'll be shocked at what might happen. I'm going to show you what happened. Hey, Jackie, your son, Evan, I said, we've got to study with him. He said, now, Rob, now, Evan, he a little different. He don't work like that, you know. I said, well, well of course he does. We've got to do a Bible. Well, Rob, now, he's a little backwards. I said, well, Jack, aren't we all? I said, you know, we, we, we've got to do a Bible. Now, Rob, I just don't think it'll be a... Sheila is listening to the conversation. Uh, Rob, go over there and talk to my son. Jackie, you know he needs a Bible study. Rob, of course, I chose to listen to Sheila. So I went over to, uh, to uh, Evan. I said, hey, Evan. I said, I'll tell you what, I said, um, I said, what do you think about uh, maybe you and I sitting down and, and talking a little bit about what's been going on with your family and a Scarlet and your sister and your, your mom and dad and talk a little bit about the Bible? He says, don't want to talk about it. And that shut me down, punt. So I just punted the football and I went back to square one. I said, well, that didn't work very well, but I never give up on people. So I'm, I'm looking for a window, you know, I'm, 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 I'm determined. I'm going to study with this young man. So I was spending a lot of time, new convert studies at their house. Evan would come by, you listen, we, we were friends. I mean, we, we didn't have any trouble talking together. I, I, I noticed he liked my airplane stories. I got it. Hey, Evan, would you like me to take you for a plane ride? He said, me? You take me up in the, I said, sure. He said, really? He said, I've always wanted to fly around the lake, uh, uh, Dale Hollow Lake. He said, I said, I'd be glad to take you. I said, on a sunny day, you could see right through the waters in Old City. They flooded when they dammed it up. 
He said, man, I love that. I said, well, I'll tell you what. I said, we'll look at the weather. We'll, we'll go up. He met me at the airport one morning. We got in the plane. We took off. Brother, you can baptize anybody at 5,000 feet. Let me tell you what. You just roll it over. And uh, I'd never do that. And um, <laughs> I'm just kidding. We, uh, we flew out the Dale Howell Lake. We flew around the lake for a little while. I even let him get up high enough. I let him fly a little bit, you know. He loved it. I mean, we're talking. Everything's great, you know. And uh, we land. I said, Evan, today is your day. I said, I'll take you anywhere you want to go eat. He said, what about up? Uh, there's only a subway. What about subway? I said, sounds good to me. So we went out to the subway. We grabbed a little bit of uh, lunch, and I got him right where I want him. Hey, Evan, uh, would, would you let me take a few minutes and talk to you about the Lord? He says, I don't want to talk about the Lord. I said, well, man, what, what do I got to do? And uh, I was about to give up right there. And then he said, now, wait, 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 Rob. When I'm ready, you'll be the first to know. I'll take it. I took that to the bank right there. I went back home. I said, Nicole, success. I said, we're that much closer. I, and I said, I don't know when it's going to happen, but it will. We went off to Bible camp, and I'm at Bible camp, and my phone rings. Phone don't ring at Bible camp. Uh, no signal, usually. Hello? Uh, Rob, this is Amy. Who in the world is Amy? Uh, Rob, I think I'm going to hell. Can you do a Bible study with me? I have never gotten a phone call like that before. I said, absolutely. I said, who in the world's Amy? I said, when are we doing this day? And she said, yeah. I said, now, Amy, why do you think you're going to hell? Well, someone gave me this book called Muscle and a Shovel. I read it, and I think I'm going to hell. And I, I said, now, who, who gave you this book? Scar Scar hey, this is Evan's girlfriend. I said, yeah, yeah. I said, Scarlett, yeah. I said, Amy, so I said, when we get home, we'll do the Bible. She said, now, Rob, she says, I got one condition. I said, well, you name it. She says, got to do the study with Evan, too. I said, Amy, um, Evan doesn't want to do the study. I know, but that's your problem now. I said, how does this keep happening to me? I, I said, I, I, hey, I got it. I said, um, uh, Amy, I said, um, you know how we go over to Jackie and Sheila's almost every Sunday to eat? Why don't uh, you get his mama, Sheila, to tell Evan that she's going to make his favorite dish? It's, it's, uh, and, and make sure, Evan knows this, and make sure that he knows that we're going to do a Bible study together. Nicole and I knew he'll stay. Problem solved. She says, great idea. So we set it up. We got back Sunday, went over to the house. Sheila cooked the famous spaghetti dinner, and uh, we sat around the table. And I said, all right. I said, let's get these booklets out. Green booklet, John 8, 32. And Evan got up and he left. He walked right out of the house. He says, no. -uh. And he walked right out of the house. He got into his Mustang. He started it up. And he, man, he's, going, he's going for a drive. He's, he's, he's gone. And, uh, man, I'm, I'm devastated. And, and I, I can't, I, Amy's devastated. And she's just about to cry. And, um, and uh, I mean, Scarlett, she's driven in all the way from Memphis just to watch. My brother, what's wrong with him? I don't understand. And then there's Sheila. She, Sheila, she's banging on the counter. Like, what is wrong with my son? I'm going to go get him. I, the family's falling apart. Now, everyone but Jackie. Jackie, the dad, he's in his easy chair reading the newspaper. I told you guys this wouldn't work. He went back to the paper. And I said, uh, um, I said, I tell you what, Amy, we need, to do, we need to do the study. I said, would it be okay if we just did the study with you and we'll worry about Evan later? She said, okay, Rob. John 8, 32. You shall know the truth. And the truth will make you free. Amy, what makes you free? She said the truth. I said, well, write it down in the blank. So she writes it down in the blank. And we went, we went through a, maybe one or two questions. And all of a sudden, she, uh, uh, I hear this noise. It's Evan. He's, he's coming back home. Evan gets back home, walks into the kitchen, uh, uh, walks right to the dining room table, sits down and looks at me. Scarlett is so excited. She said, now, no, uh, brother, you'll need, these, you'll, you'll need these booklets. I don't want the booklets. And he gave them back. And uh, Amy says, well, Evan, you'll need the Bible. I don't want the Bible. I just want to listen. And he did. And by the end of the study, he's answering all the questions. He is extremely intelligent. And I, I thought I saw the problem. In fact, uh, Amy and Evan left, and Scarlett's sitting over there. I said, Scarlett, I said, not in a million years could your family ever repay you for what's, what you've done. Go home. Your brother will not do this study in front of you. I said, in fact, Sheila and Jackie, if it's all the same to you, we'll have Evan and Amy in our home next week. Nicole fixed her one of her famous meals. Hannah fixed one of those desserts. We sat around the table. He took the book, the Bible, and we did the Bible study, and he got every question. Spot on.
I cannot wait to study through. But something happened. I got a phone call from Sheila, and it changed everything. You want to know what happened? You have to come to Lesson 5 tomorrow because I'll tell you. It's important. You need to know. This is Ed Goolsby. I'm not done. I'm going, to, I'm, going to, I'm going to take what I've learned, and I'm going to study with every person I can find. Ed Goolsby, he lives across the street. He's my neighbor. Now, I had one rule when I moved into the Willett area. The elders gave me a rule. They said, Rob, they said, go talk to anybody you want. Leave Ed Goolsby alone. And uh, he said he doesn't want to be bothered. And I said, yes, sir, you, you will, I will not bother Ed Goolsby. So, he, Rob, he doesn't like people. And I said, I will, I will respect that. And so, so I'm moving in, and I've got my dog. Her name is Rue. Rue is Border Collie, and she is Beagle, and she chases anything that moves. And uh, I don't know what to do with the dog, and, and uh, I, I need fence. There is no fence. Have you guys ever heard of the invisible fence? It's an amazing project. You put the collar on the dog, and it sets a perimeter, and any time the dog crosses it, it shocks them. They come back. I said, what an amazing invention. So I bought the invisible fence, went down to Lowe's, and I said, man, this is the cheapest fence I've ever bought. And, uh, and so, so I, I get out the directions, fellas, and I read the first line and the only line I read. It says, take six weeks to train dog. Don't need those. I just put the thing on maximum power. She'll learn. And... Um, so it's on maximum power, and uh, I put it all the way up. And uh, Rue sees a deer darting out the back of the yard. Rue sees deer. That's it. She takes off. She crosses the perimeter. It lays her out. She is shaking, yelping, and it is ex execute. It's, it's electrocuting her. And it's, it's a yelp as you could not even imagine. The kid, Dad, the dog's going to die. And they're running after the dog. I said, don't touch the dog, kids. Come back, kids. And all of a sudden, it only lasts a few seconds. She's fine. She runs across the road right under the house of Ed Goolsby, yelping. I said, oh, no. I said, all right, kids, come with me. Always bring children. And so I brought the children for cover. I said, come on, kids. And so we walked across the street. I knocked on the door. And he says, can I help you? And I said, oh, yes, sir. My I know who you are. I said, yes, sir. My name is Rob Whitaker. And, and, and sir, uh, uh, what do you want? And I said, oh, yes, sir. Um, my dog is under your house. Did you shoot your dog? And I said, oh, no, sir. I would never shoot my dog. And I said, may, may we retrieve our dog? He said, oh, get your dog. I said, children, quickly, get the dog. What an excellent evangelistic opportunity this is. I said, I said, man, I'm going to take advantage of this one. I said, sir, my name is Rob Whitaker, and I, I know who you are, and if I need you, I'll let you know. He slammed the door so hard, I thought the frame was coming out right out of I mean, I thought it was coming out of the house. Not a good first impression. Um, I never give up. They said, never. He is now my mission. I will get to him. James and Glenda had just been baptized. James works with Ed at the volunteer fire department. I said, James, I said, we're going to do a little door-to-door -to -door today on Saturday, and I need you to go to the house of Ed Goolsby and pass it out. He said, Rob, I'm not knocking on the door of Goolsby. I said, James, you work with him. Well, I do. I said, James, I'll be a holler away. Y'all know what hollers are? Y'all don't have many hollers around here. In Alabama, we got hollers. So I'm, I'm, I'm in Tennessee, excuse me, I was in Tennessee, we got big hollers in Tennessee. So I'm, I'm over there, and um, I'm passing out, and uh, flyers, and I get a phone call. It's, it's James. Hello? Hey, Rob, um, Ed wants to see you right now. I said, what? He said, I knocked on his door, and he wants to see you right now. I said, oh, no. I said, Nicole, we've got to go back. I didn't know what to expect. I got back over to, the, to, to, to Ed. It's sitting in a chair. I said, Eddie, you, you okay? He looked up at me, and tears were running down his face. I said, Ed, what's wrong? He said, Rob, I went to the doctor yesterday. Rob, I've got cancer. I don't know the Lord, Rob. I said, would you like to know him? He said, I would. I said, I know just what you need. And we baptized him. This is Charles, Mary, and Barry. And Charles Hunt is a city manager at Carthage. I didn't know this. I don't, know, I don't know who he is. And we're going to do it again. I'm going to send a group out. We, we do this a couple times a year, at least, uh, at least once a year, if not twice. And I'm going to send a, we had about 50 of us show up. And, and I, I did, did this, this new convert, her, her name is Melanie Allen. And, and this other lady, been restored, I mean, they're, they're just on fire. Her name's Betty McCarter. And uh, Betty says, Melanie and I go, Rob. And I'm thinking, well, I don't know, maybe. She says, now, Rob, we can do it. I said, all right. And, uh, and, and I give them the rules. I give them the rules. So we, we establish the rules. They go out. We go out. Everybody's going out. And we're out there. For a couple hours, I get a phone call. And uh, Betty and Melanie had found the house, Charles Hunt's. And it was on the holler way up there. 
And as they were walking along the road, they noticed vicious dogs. He trains them, vicious dogs. And they're barking, and they're barking, and they're pulling on their chains. And uh, Melanie looks at Betty, and she says, Betty, remember this morning when Rob gave us the rules? She says, I think it would be appropriate today to observe the Passover. We should pass over right now. And, 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 and. Melanie said, Betty, this could be the one. Be Betty, Melanie, this could be the one. We can't pass over. And they began to walk up to the house of Ch Charles Hunt. Charles peeps out the window. Mary, the Jehovah Witnesses are back. They won't get past me this time, Mary. I'm ready for them. I've been waiting for this opportunity. Mary, watch, come out here and watch what I do to him this time. And I mean, his blood pressure goes up every step they take. He's just uh, waiting for him to come. Here they come. Get ready. Uh, get ready. And he, they knock on the door. He opens up the door. He says, now you... Hey, Barry, Mary, it's house to house, heart to heart. They're here. They're here, that pub. Hey, y'all come in. I love that pub. B Betty doesn't know what to do. She walks in, and they sit down. He said, well, we're so glad you're here. We read this publication all the time. We surely love it. And uh, and uh, what, what did Rob tell me? To, oh, yes, yes. Would, would you like to know more about the Church of Christ? Oh, yes. She says, oh, no. Um, uh, what was the next? Oh, yes. Um, when when would you like to know? Oh, right now. Oh, no. Um, where would you like to do this? Oh, here at the church. But would you excuse me just for a minute? She walked outside, got on the phone, and my phone rings. Um, hello? Hey, hey, Betty, what's going on? Rob, I've got a hot one here, and I don't know what to do. A hot one? I said, yes, Rob, they're ready now. And I said, bring them to the church building. And she did. She brought all three of them to the church building. Nicole and I were sitting there, and I, I don't. I don't, I've never seen anything like this. So I grabbed the one study method called Does It Matter? And I, and I don't know if I'm ever going to see him again. It's the combined version of Back to the Bible. And I started the Bible study. We open our Bible, John 8, 32. You shall know the truth. And the truth will make you free. What goes in the blank? Truth. Put it down. And they loved it. I mean, they're learning more about the Bible than they've learned their whole life. I mean, I mean, they're eating it up. And you could see the glimmer. You could see the light shining in their eyes. And all of a sudden, though, Mary, her whole complexion changes. She, she gets bitter. Her, she gets them. Have you ever seen an older lady get the monobrow? Not good. And, and, and she makes the, makes the fist, and she hits the, hits the table, and she looks at me, and she, she does this to the chair, and the chair's on coaster. She goes five foot. I said, Charles, is Mary okay? I don't know, Rob. I'll be right back. Let me ask. And I looked over at Barry. Barry says, I don't know, Rob. And Nicole says, I, I, honey, I don't think this is good. And um, they talk, and they come back. And I said, now, Charles, what's wrong with Mary? Well, Rob, uh, Mary's angry. I could see that. Um, Rob, yes, Mary, I want to know. I've been going to this church all my life. They told me you did not have to be baptized. Why have they lied to me all of my life? I said, Mary, I don't know, but I know how we can fix it right now. And we did. This is Ronnie Rhodes. Ronnie Rhodes literally sat in our pews for 30 years. Anybody ever done a Bible study with Ronnie Rhodes? No. Why not? Well, we might run him off. I don't think he'll be worse off. It's amazing what happens when you do Bible studies. This is Jerry Conley. I'm at the Jacksonville Church of Christ, and I just got there, and Alan Webster's the preacher, and everybody knows Alan Webster. He directs house to house. He directs polishing the pulpit. Man's amazing. And uh, he said, Rob, would you help train us how to be evangelists here? He says, I, I, it, I, he said, something we need to work on. I said, sure. I said, Alan, I need you to give me a list of every person who sits in your pews that's lost. He gave me the list. I started with number one. His name was Jerry Conley. I said, Alan, where does Jerry live? He said, I'll take you to his house. I said, let's go. So we got in the car, and uh, we went over to the house. I'm gonna, I do the same thing to every person I meet. He knocks on the door, and he said, I just want to introduce you to one of our new members, Rob Whitaker. He said, well, Rob, nice to meet you. I said, Jerry, nice to meet you too. And, and he said, well, come on in. Walked in the house. It's a pre-Civil War house. He bought it, him and his wife, Sue Ellis, Ellen, Ellen, Sue. They're rebuilding it. The house is like from the 1850s. Like, and uh, the man's in his 70s. He's rebuilding the house. And, and he's he's... Rob, these are original uh, door fixtures, uh, original door, original uh, flooring. Rob, that's original crown molding. In the, I mean, he's, he gives me the whole history of the state of Alabama. Brethren, if I have to listen to the history of the state of Alabama to get a Bible study, I'll listen. All I want is a study. 
That's all I ever want. I am a singularly focused man. I want you to know that about me. When I meet a sinner, I want one thing, and I will get it. Hey, Jerry, would it be okay if I brought my family back and you can give them the history of Alabama? He said, oh, yeah, any day, Rob. I'll be back, I promise. I loaded my family up a few days later. We went over to that house. I have one mission. I said, Jerry, tell them about the history. Of, I'll write that. Now, this is the original crown molding, and the door, that doorknob goes back to 1850. Jerry, is that apple pie that I smell? It sure is. LSU has made you an apple pie. I said, wonderful. Let, let's go eat all we eat. We went into the kitchen. LSU brought out some, you know, they have Bluebell now in Alabama. They didn't even know what ice cream was, so they got Bluebell. And uh, he, they brought out the Bluebell and the apple pie. And we're, hey, Jerry. Yes, Rob. You know anything about the Church of Christ? No. Not since I just married Ella Sue here. You know, my, my wife had passed away. Her husband had passed away. And don't know much about it. Nice people, though, out there. I said, may I tell you something? Sure. I just so happen to have these booklets. I always have the booklets. Jerry, would you turn your Bible to John 8, 32? Oh, yeah. Uh, Ella Sue, get my Bible. I've never watched a man drive faster to a baptistry than Jerry Conley. He didn't know he was lost. You know why we don't baptize people? You don't baptize saved people. You baptize lost people. And people will never be baptized if they don't know they're lost. You've got to do a Bible study, brethren. It's the only way. It's a wonderful thing to do. I want to end my first session with a story. Some of you might know him. His name is Mel Hutzler. He was my best friend. I moved out to Bilverde, Texas. And my dad was uh, working for Delta Airlines. My dad is with us tonight, and he travels with us. We lost my mom several years back, and uh, we, we work as a family. My dad, uh, my dad moved us out to the country. thought it would be a better place to raise his family, and we moved to Bulverde. And we had a little ranch, I guess you'd call it that, a few acres. Dad had a barn. We had, dad was always fencing. And uh, we had a little... Uh, stable. We had a we had an arena for horses, and um, and uh, I, you know I'd ride horses uh, all over the place. And but I was bored, you know, nothing to do. Mom, I'm bored. She says, "Go make a friend." Well, back then that's what you did. You just walked down the street and made a friend. Well, I walked down the street about a half mile, knocked on the door. Mel Hutzler came to the door. Will you be my friend? Sure. That was it. We're best friends, and we grew up together. We went all over Bulverde hunting doing everything, whatever we could do, we did it, you know. And um, one day I went up to my dad. I said, Dad, I said, why, why does Mel have crosses all over his house? He's got them on the door, uh, got them on the walls, got a, got an altar in the, with Mary on it everywhere. Dad, what is that? He said, oh, hey, Mel is Catholic. I said, what? Yeah, Cat I said, well, what do you mean? Isn't he a Christian? Let me, let me explain it to you, Rob. But, Dad, I want him to be a Christian. He said, teach him. That's what I did. I'm not very good at it. I don't know what I'm doing. And uh, so I, I, I'd, I'd say things. Mel, why do you guys uh, um, sprinkle the babies when the Ethiopian eunuch went down into the water? I don't know, Rob. Mel, why do you call your priest father when the Bible says call no? I don't know, Rob. Uh, Mel, um, why was the first pope married? Uh, I don't know. Where's the Catholic Church in the Bible? Uh, I don't know. That was my way of doing Bible studies. Then he started going to church with them. I still remember driving up to San Marcos, Texas, and we heard a preacher by the name of Sammy Jones, 11-day meeting. We went one night, one of the most powerful sermons I've ever heard. Then John Shannon preached at the Shenandoah Lectureship in San Antonio, Texas. Do you know what his topic was? Why I left the Catholic Church. It sent chill, chills up and down my spine as we sat there and listened to John Shannon preach that lesson. It wasn't long after his mail walked into me at my room, and he were just talking. He said, hey, Rob, I need your help. I said, what? He said, I want to become a Christian, and I need your help. I can't tell you. That's one of the greatest days of my life. I'm my best friend. I said, man, I went to tell Dad and Mom. I said, Dad, Mom, Mel wants and We're celebrating. You know, we're, this is so exciting. He said, oh, by the way, Rob, I, I need one thing from you. I said, well, you just name it, Mel. You got to explain this to Dad. Well, I said, of course. I said, Mom, Dad, we'll be back. Going to convert Mel's family. It won't take long. And so we got in the car, and I, we, we, we went back to Mel's house, and he said, now, Dad, uh, now, you got to know something about Mel's dad. He's a violent man. I'm scared of him, but not today. I'm not scared today. 
Mr. Hutzler sat around the table. And Rob, what do you want to tell me? I said, well, Mr. Hustler, we've been doing this Bible study. He said, yeah. I said, uh, I tried to teach his dad like I taught Mel. Did not work very well. The more I talked, the angrier the man got. And finally, he got so angry, he stood up, uh, and, he, and, he, and he grabbed his wallet out of the back of his pant pocket, and he threw it at me like a fastball. And he said, he said, son, you get out of this house. You can take my money, but you will not take my son. Mel got up. He tried to explain things to his dad. The more explanation happened, the angrier the man got. He said, get out of this house. I better never see you again. You better never be around my son again. Mel came over and said, my dad's going to hurt you, Rob. Get out of this house right now. He picked me up and carried me out of the house. I'm shaking. He said, Rob, we'll have to talk later. And I went home. I walked through the door in tears. And I crawled into the arms of my mother, and I just bawled. I'm 18 years old, and I've just lost my best friend. And um, my mom tried to console me that night. I would not be consoled. And the doorbell rings. Dad says, Rob, we walked to the door at 9 o'clock. Doorbell doesn't ring at 9 o'clock out there. And Dad opened it up slowly, and the other side of the door was Mel Hutzler with two suitcases in his hand. Mr. Whitaker, my dad says I could be a Catholic and stay home. I could become a Christian and I have to leave. Mr. and Mrs. Whitaker, I, I want to be a Christian and I have no place to live. And my mother grabbed him and said, son, as long as we're in this house, this house is your house. Come on inside. They gave him the back bedroom. He walked inside, he unpacked his clothes, and there he lived. We kept encouraging Mel to obey the gospel, but he hadn't. My dad had kept encouraging Mel to make things right with his dad, and finally he had a meeting with him. He said, son, you can come home. He said, on one condition, you must have a Bible study with Monsignor. I said, Mel, what's a Monsignor? One level up from a Catholic priest. Huge giver. They're bringing out their big guns all the way from San Antonio to do the Bible study. I said, man, Mel, this is amazing. We're going to convert the whole Catholic church. This is exciting. And I said, let's get our Bibles out. We got our Bibles out, and we started studying. Man, I had every verse underlined we needed. And I was ready that day. That day, I woke up, and I had the stomach flu. It was awful. And uh, Mel postponed the meeting. He said, Rob, I meant to tell you this. My dad said, I can't bring you. I must do it alone. I said, Mel, you can't go up against a Monsignor by yourself. He said, don't worry. I won't be. I have everything I need. The Monsignor drove up all the way to that cathedral in Bulverde. Mel walked into the office where the priest in the cathedral and the, and the Monsignor sat. Mr. Monsignor, I just have a few questions, and if you could answer these questions, it, it won't take long. I need to know why in the Bible that it says you've got to go down into the water. We spray. Now, now, Mel, you don't need to be quoting that book to me, but Mr. Monsignor, in Acts chapter 8, verse number 35 through 40, the Bible says they went down into. He said, now stop quoting that book to me. Now, you don't have, Mr., but Mr. Monsignor, the Bible said, I told you to stop quoting that book to me, and he took the Bible out of his hands, and he put it on the desk. He said, son, it is my job to tell you what that book says. And we don't just follow the Bible. We follow the Bible and tradition, and I'll interpret it for you. Mel picked up his Bible calmly. He said, Mr. Monsignor, as far as I'm concerned, this Bible study is over. On Sunday morning at the Northern Oaks Church of Christ in San Antonio, Texas, without a dry eye in that auditorium, they watched a young man leave his earthly father for his heavenly father, and he was baptized. We went to preaching school together at Southwest in Austin, Texas. Today, Mel Hutzler is the preacher at the Northern Oaks Church of Christ where he was baptized. I just spoke to him just a few minutes ago. That picture is taken at the Southwest School of Bible Studies. We went to preaching school together, and we do mission work every year together. He is the most courageous man I've ever met. The Bible says in John 4 and 35, Lift up your eyes, look on the fields, for they are white unto harvest. Brethren, there are people for you to teach everywhere. Jesus, when he said this, he meant it. What we need to do is believe it, and I'm here this week for the next couple days to teach you how to do it. Thank you for being here, and God bless you for that.
I've got a few housekeeping items that I need to take care of. You were given as you walked into this auditorium a book. Everyone needs this because we're going to refer to it. You're going to take a lot of notes. I'm going to give you a five-minute break. You're going to need this. Make sure you got it. You're going to need the set of Back to the Bible. This is provided by the church. Make sure you have these materials. Now, all the other materials on the table are for sale. And so if you have any questions, you can ask my children, ask my dad. We'll be glad to help you. I'll be explaining what those materials are. Let me give you one explanation now. This is this entire seminar on DVD. You want to go and watch this? You want to give it to your friends? You want to take it to your church? This is the DVD you need. But I want to tell you about what else is in there, a Bible study. So what Don Blackwell said years ago, he said, Rob, he said, we don't even know what a Bible study looks like, so they filmed it. I took two people, my wife and I, Nicole, we, we taught two people, and we took them from the Bible to the baptistry, and they filmed the entire study. If you want to learn how to do a Bible study, you can watch us do it. We'll be glad to train you and show you how to do it. Those are the kind of tools you'll find on that table. There's a lot more we'll talk about. We're glad you're here. When we start up the next session, I'm going to put these clipboards in your hands. We're going to sign you up for one of our tools. It's free. And we're going to equip you to, to, uh, to bring the gospel to the lost. If you have any questions, just ask us. We'll take a five, ten-minute break. Come back in. So don't go anywhere. We're going to put this into gear. I'm going to start teaching you the principles of evangelism. There are seven of them. I'm going to teach you three tonight, four tomorrow. And so God bless you, brethren. Let's take a five-minute break. Thank you.